Yeah, welcome back everybody here to this new edition of the ECD Live Talk. Uh, my name is Alexander Otto. I'm the head of corporate relations uh, at Tradebyte. And uh, welcome everybody here out there in this wonderful pop-up studio again that we built up just for you out there. Um, I have a very special guest today in this actually really streaming live moment. And uh, I just want to kind of go back a bit because I made up my mind before this talk and I thought about um, what meeting people meant, means to me. And I think it, 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 it sometimes shows you something new and, and uh, meeting people inspires you and makes you think differently about things you thought you'd know. And so when I first met my guest today, um, Ryan Mullins, it was one of these special moments. Uh, he has this fantastic gift to make complex coherences easy to understand. And I suddenly found myself um, in a conversation about spatial computing and Generation Z and a thing called the metaverse. And, you know, the thing is, Ryan wants to make you understand. And that's the big difference um, to people who want just to show off how smart they are. And so I couldn't be more excited to have him in the show today. And so welcome, Ryan. Hello. Hello, man. Thank you for having me. We, we meet again. Yeah, we meet again. I mean, uh, it's, it's been a while in life, uh, but we, yeah. we had a couple of talks and um, um, I was so excited about, about today. And uh, it really looks good. Are you in, in, a, in an office or where are you? Uh, yeah, this is my, uh, the man cave at my house. So this is uh, just kind of my, my daily work spot. So uh, yeah, I think at, at this point, given, uh, you know, given COVID and the way that we've, you know, not all of us have those nice virtual pop-up studios like you do, but, uh, you know, got some nice camera equipment and uh, I got a podcast I'm doing now. So I got a decent, you know, microphone and everything. So yeah, it sounds uh, decent, uh, I tell you, um, but maybe just to start from the beginning, um, Introduce yourself and wh where you came from, what you do, and what is that is written on your shirt there. I mean, you have oh, to yeah. explain it. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm the CEO and the co-founder of a new startup that's called Aglet. Um, actually, the name of the company isn't Aglet. The name of the company is probably something that we're going to talk about later, which is uh, On Life. So in O N L I F E, On Life, um, and this is something that you know, it's sort of always embodied uh, my life, but it's just something that I noticed increasingly, um, which is that you don't live online anymore. You don't really live offline anymore. Uh, you just live at the convergence of online and offline. And that's what we call on life. Um, we think it's now an on life world. So we live now in a space where the virtual and the physical have kind of fused into one. Um, and so uh, you know, some, some of the ways of seeing that are like Pokemon Go, for instance, using location-based mechanics, um, sort of an, an, an augmented reality, being able to fuse those two things together. So that's, those are the kinds of things that I'm interested in, are these, these trends that seem to really impact the world every 10 to 15 years. Um, and I think we're on the cusp of some really kind of Herculean consequences as these two worlds fuse together. And so my background is in startups. So this is actually my third startup that I've done. Um, and prior to um, prior to working here at Aglet, um, I led the, uh, well, I was the digital uh, director of future trends at Adidas. Um, I kind of served as almost like an entrepreneur in residence. It was, uh, you know, how do you help the three stripes as a, as a brand um, expand digital beyond e-commerce? Right. I think viewing, di viewing, even using the word e-commerce is, is a mistake now. Right. It's just it's com it's commerce. Um, and to the on life point in an on life world, there is no e-commerce or commerce. There's simply commerce. Um, and so um, I started Aglet um, last year. So I left Adidas in September of 2019 um, and I raised uh, a pre-seed round of funding from an excellent investor, uh, Lake Star Ventures based in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, we released the product in May, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's on iOS only right now. But it's uh, something like imagine a Pokemon Go 
experience for a new kind of retail experience or a new kind of commerce experience. Yeah, I just wanted to go a bit deeper into that because thanks for the introduction. I mean, that's very, yeah, yeah, yeah. been through a lot. I mean, in a positive way, startups, corporate, and we come back to that later on. But um, the thing, Aglet, I mean, you, you mentioned Pokemon Go and this kind of located based interaction, or um, as I would call it, uh, you do it better. And um, can you give us a more deeper insight what it's all about? Uh, I mean, it's a lot about the sneaker world. Uh, I know that because I'm, I'm using uh, Aglet from, from the beginning. Um, yeah. But maybe you let us look a little deeper into that, what, what it's all about. Sure. So one of the, I guess, the kind of the Marvel superhero origin story here is that um, in the end of September uh, in Germany, actually, in 2016 is when I played Pokemon Go for the first time. Um, and I remember within about 15 minutes of playing that game, um, I, you know, I do remember just thinking, actually, this is how I shop. You know, I, I'm a, so I'm a, I'm a sneakerhead. So I've got a, I won't embarrass myself with revealing how many I have <laughs> on this call, but I have an insane number of sneakers. I've been collecting since I was 10. Uh, you know, I, I've really been in the streetwear kind of sneaker culture for a while. And it's been crazy to see the insane growth, uh, the market growth that's happened and the cultural growth of sneakers and streetwear. It's now become sort of the cultural node or the, sorry, the central node for global youth culture. Um, and so as I was playing that, you, you know, you're going around various places, you're trying to hunt and find these, you know, these, um, um, uh, these creatures that are lying around a Pikachu or a Charmander or whatever. And, but that's basically how shopping is now for Gen Z and millennials, right? Or these brands release very limited numbers of product. So it's sort of artificial scarcity, right? They'll release limited product. And now you're competing against millions of people around the world to try to get those before anyone else does. And it's become so crazy that you're not even competing against human beings. You're also competing against sneaker bots. So bots that shop for you. Right, and they're able to go through the captcha. They're able to go through the all, entering all the information, your credit card information, faster than any human can enter them. And so that's why you also see these secondary marketplaces where you hear crazy stories about you know kids building up their own businesses, reselling sneakers for five to ten x the retail price. Right. So that idea of sort of sending you on a quest, or it's even 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 in sneaker culture, they're called holy grails. These are the sneakers that everybody wants that are just yeah. so hard to find. So even that King Arthur and the quest for the holy grail. So shopping has kind of become this sort of quest and this challenge, and that's why it's a game. And so as I was playing Pokemon Go and thinking, wow, this is just how I shop, it just occurred to me, like I literally have to make a game. Shopping is now a game. I'm sure we'll go into a little bit later one yeah, of my of course. core thesis. <laughs> what, what, what are my core thesis that gaming gaming is actually eating the world now, um, and 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 why why exactly that is? But you know, so it's imagine Pokemon Go meets a kind of virtual Footlocker, um, and that's currently sort of what the experience is um, on Aglet. Um, we're very early stage, so we're still basically in a beta. Um, we've just raised a really big funding round, so we've you know we've raised this year seven million. So. You know, we're really starting to f uh, flesh out the team, and now we can start really adding additional layers to the game experience. Um, so we're very excited about 2021. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm, I'm excited too what's going to happen there. But let me break this down again for kind of, you know, you can't play with like play or walk around in virtual sneakers in the Aglet yeah. app, but you also yeah. earn, as you call it, Aglet or yeah. buy, buy golden coins or, or whatever to actually buy sneakers that you can use in the app. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So how it works is you come into the game and we gift you uh, three pairs of sneakers. So just kind of basic, what, what our players call grinders. <laughs> so these are your grinders, right? These are your basic sneakers. And so I'm actually, in, you're incentivized and encouraged to walk in the world. So getting out in front of a screen, believe it or not, and actually walking around, uh, you know, in the world. And so we have a built-in step tracker. Um, and so as you're taking steps in the real world, um, it's impacting your digital gameplay. So that step tracker now converts kind of your energy or your steps into our aglet currency. And then once you have that at more and more aglet currency, then you're able to go into the aglet sneaker shop. And there is um, a collection or, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, sneakers that are very, very hard to get. Some of them are easy to get. 
but it's basically, you know, if you're into sneakers and you're into streetwear, these are kind of all the things that you want in reality that you basically can't really get in reality. And so given our audience, which is kind of 13 to, you know, 20 year olds, they find owning virtual skins and virtual gear for their avatars just as important, um, if not almost as important as having, you know, the real thing. And so the core game loop then is explore and walk around in the real world, um, earn this currency, and the more currency you have, the more you're going to be able to buy and collect in the game. And again, that's a very basic experience right now, but that's how we've how we've started. And so some of the tricks here, you know, we ha we have a map. There's a map in the game, just like in Pokemon Go. And so as you're wearing this virtual sneaker as you walk around, um, it actually gets dirty, just like your products would in real life. And so on the map are these stations, these geofence stations. If anybody here has played Pokemon Go, you know what I mean, or if you play like Geocache, for instance. Um, and so you actually have to go physically to specific locations and you can check in there. And when you check in, some of them could repair and clean your sneakers. Um, we could also drive foot traffic into retail stores. So if you're wearing a pair of Adidas, you could check in to that Adidas retail store. Perhaps you could get a 20% or 50% off coupon. Um, you could um, get a, a, a tr what we call a treasure, a treasure box, a treasure sneaker box that you open. You have some different kinds of loot in there. So it really is about what, you know, what Jack Ma from Alibaba called new retail. It is that retail is no longer a shop or a store. It is just this experience. And it's driven by this location-based gameplay um, with virtual goods. But imagine now that you're walking around and there's a virtual pop-up shop on the map from you know, Adidas, let's say, or you know, Nike or New Balance or something like that. And I check into that and what pops up is actually a web view where I can purchase physical product. So this isn't only about virtual goods, it's about creating a location-based platform for, for spatial commerce that's physical and virtual goods. I mean, I think we, we, we go deeper into that later because um, what is of interest for me is, again, or also how that triggers maybe future trends of, of commerce in general, like yeah. this idea of gaming is everywhere. What does that mm. to, to the commerce world or the retail world, as we call it today? Um, but I want to um, just do one of the three basic elements of this EZD Live Talk format. And uh, we have three of them. And the first one um, I'm going to do with you is called Pocket Check. And as you said, you're a sneakerhead and you have an insane amount of sneakers uh, somewhere there. I think the question would be easy, but I wanted to know what you um, was the last thing you purchased online and the last thing you purchased offline. And I mean, I think I know the answer, right? Um, actually, I think in this case, um, I did not buy a pair of sneakers. The last thing that I bought was um, online was, uh, well, two things. I bought uh, a new MacBook Pro, uh, the 13-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 chip, um, so which doesn't ship until uh, first week of December. That's kind of annoying. But um, <laughs> yeah, I ordered that, and then I actually got a new gaming PC. So I got a, an Alien, a friend of mine works at Alienware, so I got an uh, Alienware, the new uh, Aurora R11, so... Pretty, 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 pretty maxed out. Got the NVIDIA GeForce 3080 chip. Uh, so I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty excited. So those are the two things. The last sneaker I bought was actually yesterday. I was filming in Dusseldorf uh, a kind of a concept video and I bought a pair of old school, uh, actually American made sneakers called Autry. It's an old old uh, American brand, so. But I mean, now, uh, you talk, we talk about sneakers and you have to name the insane number. Please do it for us. Oh, I've, I have close to 400, oh. like very, let's just say very close. Yeah, very, very close. I mean, it's 399, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks for that. Okay, um, uh, the, the, new, the new Apple, we, maybe we'll come to that later also. But um, what I came up with, with yesterday, um, and I wanted to just drop that in because I was thinking a lot last night about it, actually, that... Um, when you read about the thing called digital or the web 20 years ago, um, and as it all was very new and kind of in democratic open space where you allowed to be free and it was not so brand related and, and corporate and stuff like that, there was a certain optimism about that 
feeling to be there. And I like that very much. And I, and I think it's been forgotten a bit, that feeling that it's, op it's an optimistic idea to have mm. a kind of second world, as, <laughs> as you remember, maybe there was a game that yeah. was called like this. Second Life. Uh, second Life. And now it, it's, it's a bit like a, a data transfer and be careful and you are kind of steered in directions by corporations and stuff like that. Um, the thing you do looks into the future, and is it an optimistic thing? I mean, can you be, can you still be optimistic, like without limits to say, hey, this is good, this is something good, mm. where we're heading, or well, how, do you, how do you see that? I love this question, great question. Um, yeah, it's, it's something I've been thinking about quite a lot as well. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm actually really just so bored with uh, kind of the cyber, kind of the default cyberpunk mentality, which is, you know, big tech, um, this kind of dystopian scenario, um, everything sucks, you know, we're all doomed. Um, if you, uh, you know, Peter Thiel and Tyler Cowen, who are, you know, two of my intellectual heroes, um, are often talking about, like, you know, also the default state of science fiction today is is very negative. Like, can you even imagine a positive science fiction film? Like, is it even possible to make one anymore? It's like, who, who wants to go to space after you've seen the movie Gravity, you know, or like, um, you know, it's just like so many examples that, you know, like we're, it's almost deterministic in the sense that technology is now kind of achieved, you know, the Frankenstein novel of we created something and now it's, it's fully determined uh, the direction of the future, which appears to be this kind of doomsday scenario. Um, and that's, I'm sort of a militant optimist kind of by nature. So I'm not, I enjoy those stories. I mean, I love the matrix movies and I love, um, you know, of course, William Gibson stuff, even early Neil Stevenson. I mean, the word metaverse comes from a Neil Stevenson novel from 96, I think snow crash. So, um, I, but I'm kind of tired of that. And I think a lot of people are as well. And so there's a new kind of movement called solar punk, which tries to focus more on the optimistic side which is very similar actually in nature to the second Lego movie, uh, if, you get, if you have any of those fans mm -hmm. out there, which is, you know, hey, everything is not awesome, you know, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna sing it here, but you know, everything is not awesome, but that doesn't mean, you know, we shouldn't try to build it new. Um, and so I think that's where I'm at, that's where a lot of other people are, and it's kind of what solar punk literature tries to do is a, a sort of look at things and say, hey, it's, it's a struggle, but like, where's the hope? Um, and where, where, you know, what, what, when you bring up kind of that 90s web sort of early internet community literature, um, like, you know, whole earth catalog type stuff or yeah. Kevin Kelly, Kevin Kelly's, uh, Kevin Kelly's work. I've been going back and reading a lot of that. Um, and it's fantastic to read because it's so energetic and it's optimistic. A lot of people might, you know, ironically laugh at it and say like, oh, it's techno utopian, blah, blah, which is just another kind of techno dystopian attitude. Um, but, you know, I just think that uh, we're again going into this new phase where it's incredibly exciting. There's incredible amounts of opportunity and technology is not just neutral by nature. You know, fire is amazing, but it can do all these amazing things. It can also do really horrendous things. Um, it's the same thing with the internet. It'll be the same thing with virtual worlds and game worlds. Um, so, Yes, I am by default an optimist. Um, I don't think I'm naive, but at the same time, I'm just looking forward to all the opportunities that are going to come in this next wave of this kind of spatial internet opportunity um, and all the opportunities that that will create for people to start you know, new brands, for new entertainment experiences, new media experiences, new consumption experiences, um, and new, new ways to just make things magical is what I'm, I'm ultimately interested in. Yeah, that's great because I'm, an, I'm a kind of, you said militant optimist. I totally know what you mean because I feel the same about stuff. But there's one thing that, that I cannot get off my mind because it's like I, I'm, I'm nearly 44 years old. So I, I remember when that all started and you had that clear separation 
at least for me as a Generation X guy, um, mm. with that virtual world or w however it was called that time. And you went in and said, oh, that was great. And that was fun. And it was kind of relaxation and uh, switch off my mind a bit. And then, yeah. and then escapist thing and then go back to the real world. What you are saying with the on life idea is that there is no real world in that, in, in that perspective anymore, that it, it kind of mingles together and you don't know whether you're online or offline and you don't have that, you know, separation or or to put it in a negative way, that hiding space anymore to say, oh, let's go back to real life. I have everything under control and I know what happens if I go to the bathroom, but I don't know what happens mm. if I go to the bathroom in Fortnite or I don't know, because there yeah. is maybe something waiting for me that I th should think about to buy. And I don't want to think mm. about to buy if I'm going to the bathroom. And so right. I, I think where is that? Is that we have to get used to that because that's what it's going to be. And is that, is that the optimistic kind of approach to say, yeah, get it, get, get it real. That's it. Or, uh, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of space to discuss about left. Yeah, absolutely. So there was a, um, there was a Forbes article that came out about Aglet, uh, like, I don't know, like five months ago, maybe three, four months ago. Um, and the title was, uh, you know, it was, it's a great piece, by the way, I'm not throwing shade on, on the article or the author, uh, cause he did a fantastic job, but the title was, um, where people spend thousands of dollars on sneakers that don't exist. Um, and so why I think that's such an interesting title is because, um, it already makes a kind of value judgment yeah. on what's real and what's fake. Um, and even that word fake. Um, so I think that there is a mindset or a mental model from us from certain generations where you have real stuff. And, I, and, you know, we went through this a little bit with music where the old generation was like, oh, you don't own it. Uh, you don't own the music. Like I like my vinyl, you know, or my my eight track collection. I like to feel it. Um, but that quickly went. I mean, there's still people that own those things. But, you know, it's sort of streaming what we're doing right now kind of went away from that the tactility and, you know, kind of the empirical experience of things. Um, and I think the same is true of, you know, virtual skins. That's just kind of where we are now is a certain generation looks at these game experiences and looks at virtual goods and virtual objects as being fake. Um, but when you actually look at the behavior of young kids in these worlds that live in these, in multiple worlds, whether it's Animal Crossing, Minecraft, Fortnite, um, Genshin, Impact, you know, I mean, it's like all these different worlds and they're spending collectively billions of dollars collecting and buying these virtual skins in these games experience. And so I think that with every successive generation, you have a collapse of binaries. Mm. You know, there's always like one core binary that exists that almost kind of defines the generation. And I think that one of them where we are today is this real versus virtual. And I think that part of on life is just seeing that We live now in a Twitch world where in the, in the past, if you were an amazing player of a video game, who knew? There was no like social status consequences for you being an amazing Super Mario Brothers player. You know, uh, even, even when we had, you know, pre-Twitch, it's not that long ago. Like, even if you were an amazing player in a game, like, who again, who knew about that? And so there was no like eruption out of the game world into reality. And what Twitch did was kind of create this interface where your performance and skill and your entertainment in a virtual world has real world status consequences. Now you don't walk into school as some smelly, you know, gamer geek. You walk into school as like this guy or girl who's dope at a, at a game and they have 10 million followers or whatever, or 10,000 subscribers. And so Twitch is an example of how those how those two things come together. It creates kind of this portal between the worlds. Um, and so I think as a result of that, you start to see this binary of real and virtual breakdown. And so um, the optimism there for me is less that, the, again, it's not the determinism of the dystopia, which is that everything's going to suck just kind of by, by default. The optimistic view and kind of the more the utopian view is everything's going to be amazing. Um, I'm more of a protopian view, which is that there are tons of really awesome opportunities 
that are in this space, and we have to do our best to try to capture those. And what I call the Prometheus principle, which is how do you start to democratize access to those opportunities so that more and more people can can flourish uh, in in those new opportunity spaces. I mean that that's that's the the thing where it all comes down to. You you have to give all not only the generation Z but also the generation X and the so-called yeah. silver service maybe the same access or make it so easy understandable that they want to do it. Just do it. Um, but I want to just uh, one segment of it, because in Aglet, uh, it's also about sneakers. So it's about kind of fashion and it's about um, retail or purchasing or the opportunity. So I, I wonder what that, um, what that means maybe also for fashion retail, because a lot of our viewers are maybe interested in that. What, what is the, the, the trigger there or what is the trend for the future? Do I have to completely change my buying behavior because uh, there are other access points or access points where I even don't know about any, uh, anything about yeah. in, in two years. Like you said, if you don't have the Aglet app or, or else, uh, you mm -hmm. cannot have that sneaker, but it's uh, because it's only available at that location, virtual location in, in that New Balance store. And yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of been let out of this idea if I don't fit in and don't have the access. Yeah. And that's a bit, you know, mm. it, it should yeah. not be in excluding a generation or to, they, 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 they want to buy, they have the money to buy, and how do you or how can we bring them in? Mm. Yeah, no, no, that's also a good question. I think, you know, it's, it's also one of those things where, you know, like I have to still, you know, have a credit card Uh, if I want to shop on Amazon or, you know, even if I want to have an iPhone, you know, like, if, so if I want access, you know, or, or even a, a smart and, you know, uh, an Android phone, like I've got a, I still have to put my credit card details in that. So it sort of requires one to have, you know, a bank account. And so it's, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't think that I'm not so utopian that I think that what Aglet's doing is immediately going to like make everything accessible to everyone. We're not Amazon yet, um, the everything store. But, you know, I, I do think that, um, for example, some, you know, like one of my one of my missions in this is there is kind of a duopoly at the moment, you know, in in, in sneakers, which is Nike and Adidas, um, you know, and we, and we love both of those brands. But there has to be more opportunities for new brands to start emerging and competing. It's actually better right? Um, when there's more competition there. So what we're really also trying to do is it doesn't have to be Gucci or Nike or Adidas that have these pop-up shops. It could be, you know, look at Roblox and Minecraft, you know, or creator mode and Fortnite. I mean, these are just like YouTube. These are quote unquote amateurs who are creating businesses on that platform. And so that's what we're, we're really looking at. You know, we just did November was creator month for us, which was, um, a way to open up designs for the entire community. We had, you know, thousands of really amazing submissions from kids who were, you know, 13 years old up to uh, 45, 50 years old that were submitting designs about and, and their inspirations behind it um, and really kind of flexing their, uh, their design genius and their creativity. I want those people to be able to open a shop on Aglet um, to sell these virtual goods, you know, and imagine... If you live in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and you've got, you know, or, you know, somewhere podunk in Germany somewhere, but you've got this amazing skill at design, you could have a pop-up shop on Times Square. Um, and again, that requires that the platform of Aglet starts to grow and grow and gets bigger so that we have both sides of the marketplace. But, um, no, I do think that... Uh, You know, it, we don't want it to be kind of this walled garden thing where you you have to access everything um, within Aglet. So we need to overlap on other platforms. But I do think where we're going um, is, you know, this kind of spatial internet idea is we're going to a place where, um, you know, these are coming out soon. We're going to have, mm. you know, augmented, we're going to have smart glasses. And I think that's going to be the kind of the tech stack of, of this next 10 to 15 year cycle, which is going to be, you know, these ear pods, a wearable of some kind. For me, I'm in the Apple ecosystem, so an Apple watch. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to have Apple glasses, which will be powered by this phone. 
and you're gonna have two LiDAR sensors here, just like this phone has a LiDAR sensor in the back, and everything is a possible screen. Apple just announced the Apple Clips in, in June at the WWDC. It's basically a new kind of QR code that when you're walking around, you just look and boom, it generates a kind of minority report or Iron Man you know, type interface that you can now interact with something. So you actually don't need to download an app. It's just, again, it's the world. It's on life. It's just there. Everything's a screen. Everything is a potential interactive opportunity. And I think that's where we're going. And that to me is very game-like. You know, and um, that's very game like. And I, I, I want to stop there because the game thing, I want to come back later yeah. um, um, because it's time for our second element. And uh, this is oh. a surprise one for you because okay. uh, it's called speed lane. And uh, the rules of play are I have two a word pair like, uh, for example, coffee or tea. And you have okay. to decide for one. Coffee. Yeah, I see it. Um, and you can only have one and you can neither have two or neglect. Okay. Both. So you have All to right. decide. I have and to pick one. All right. I have to pick one as quick as possible. Like let your let your belly speak and not your brain. You know. All right. <laughs> You're ready? Easy. That's easy. Okay, I, I think am. so. Um, let's start off with. Uh, I'm very interested in this one, but I know the answer already. I think, hip hop or punk rock? Oh, definitely hip hop. Please, why? <laughs> Why hip hop? Oh, I just grew. I just grew up on hip hop. I mean, I, I, um, I actually, I enjoy, I enjoy uh, punk rock, but it's just not something that uh, I don't know. I just identify with hip hop. You know, it's obviously sneaker culture is very much driven by hip hop. Hip hop's very much driven by sneaker culture. Um, I, I grew up on it, man. Like that's just my, it's my jam. Jazz, jazz, and hip hop are my two. That's, that's my jam. If you link it to sneakers, you grew up on it and in it, like. Sneakers from online. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. It is. Um, the second one, um, Apple or Elf? Apple. I think we got it already. You you mentioned that you are totally in the Apple ecosystem. Fanboy. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, the third one, uh, also very interesting, I think. Uh, autonomy or control? Uh, autonomy. You had to think about it. I did have to think about it because I, I actually, I almost reject that they're different. Um, so I think picking one or the other is actually picking one or the other. So for example, if you are autonomous, um, you know, I mean, there's autonomous cars, right? Obviously, but then there's also, I mean, and you would probably know this just as well as I do in, 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 you know, German philosophy, there is, you know, Kant sort of started this idea of autonomy the autonomous individual, which is kind of by definition what the Enlightenment was about. Um, and so all autonomy is, is having control over yourself. So uh, I'll go with autonomy. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, if you put Kant in the game, I think then we have to skip this for the future because you explain it and you kind of put it, pull it out of the game, this one. Right. Uh, <laughs> Although that's kind, of, that's kind of Hegelian, that's Hegel is sort of bringing the two uh, things together. So maybe Kant wasn't a good example. Yeah, but I got it. I got it. I, yeah, I, right. I had to read it uh, one time in my life. Um, the next one, um, uh, vinyl or Spotify? Spotify. Definitely Spotify. Um, I don't have a record player. Um, I've never had a record player. Um, however, I do have records. Um, I have one here, in fact. Um, it's my favorite album of all time. Uh, it's uh, it's called Black Saint and the Sinner Lady. It's uh, Charles Mingus, oh, uh, jazz mu American jazz musician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, just an incredible album. And so I love the old art covers, like especially jazz art covers, like uh, um, Herbie Hancock stuff. You know, Mingus's stuff, Dexter Gordon. It's just like this amazing Miles Davis's stuff. Like this a really amazing artwork that I don't know doesn't really seem to be there anymore. Partly because it's gone so digital, where the art cover doesn't, at least on the surface, doesn't seem to matter so much. Um, yeah, but I'm more of a Spotify guy um, for sure. Actually, I'm Apple Music. I don't even use Spotify. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. what you mentioned—the the cover art and stuff, and this kind of yeah. taking it in your hands was one of the reasons I, again, bought a vinyl yeah. player, record player, a couple of years ago, and started reusing my old records because I'm Gen, Z, I'm Gen X, so yeah. I had one, and uh, I also buy the one or the other because actually then 
the another thing is the sound and it's mm. actually there's something to feel if you play a vinyl mm. i'm not yeah, a vinyl yeah. geek like with 10,000 records but there's a difference right. so okay. but i thought maybe because of the hip hop culture i thought it might be interesting if you did some of the vinyl yeah, stuff unfortunately not i i wish i wish i did man but no <laughs> Can't do everything. I, can't do uh, everything. <laughs> Last thing on the list: um, Are you an entertainer or a moderator? I'm definitely, I would say, an entertainer. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't need, I don't need much, uh, <laughs> much thought about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean that also uh, in, in a personal way, and it also refers to kind of um, how you behave in business. If you like, yeah. do the, your stuff, and the others have to follow. And you yeah. are the entertainer and, and kind of front row, or you are more the, the team moderator. I think that there's a, there's an aspect that's also very interesting to to yeah. to a different business perspective on this one. Absolutely, I think it's you know it comes down to you know what kind of a CEO are you, or what kind of a manager are you? Are you more like a Tim Cook type? Uh, just because you gave the Apple example, uh, you know Tim Cook's not you know a visionary like Steve Jobs was a visionary. He he is a you know, one of the great operators um, and executors of all time. You know, I mean, that guy's just unbelievable. But then you have these kind of rare creatures like, a, you know, like a Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk who are both, or an Andy Grove, who are these kind of visionary geniuses, but also, and product geniuses, but also, you know, execution and operationally, they just get things done, especially in these like crazy, you know, supply chain businesses like they have. So um, I'm definitely more on kind of the the vision entertainment side, um, but then you know what I have to do is kind of oversee. It's very small given we're not a big team, but like just kind of overseeing. Okay, where are things? What's kind of the charge? Is it positive or negative at the, at this particular time? If it's product, then I have to kind of dip in and try to you know electrify it a little bit so that it gets back on track. Or if it's our social stuff or whatever. So it's a little bit of both, but by default I'm more entertainment. Yeah, it's also a difference if you're working within the startup organization or within a corporate like you did at Adidas. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. to moderate a lot, I think, if you have a certain role at a specific place in kind of hierarchy or team units. And so yeah. you can build it whatever you yeah. want to build and at Aglet, I think. That's also a difference where well, you are. Autonomy. It's more autonomy, yeah. Um, so coming back, um, thanks for that. I, I love this um, all the time. Yeah, it's fun. And it's, uh, yeah, I think... Um, There are some great answers, and I want to come back to this. We talked a lot about gaming. The, the gaming thing and the, the mm. gamification, as it's like right. the, the buzzword. And so, um, for me, as a kind of middle-aged guy <laughs> who mm. is not much into like a gaming world, like a gaming geek or something, I, I, I recognized it and I'm very interested in it from a very theoretical standpoint, but I'm not into it. I cannot feel it. And so I'm I'm it's a bit a bit hard for me to to see or feel that compelling thing that kind of revolves everything right now and is, is the game changer for both like you you as a person uh, as a corporate brand like you, you you have to get into that world uh, especially in fashion maybe um, maybe more than if you're building refrigerators I don't know because mm. fashion is like like a lifestyle thing like like a game right. is or so so yeah. um, wh what is that switch from being from being a game like you play then to uh, it, you live in a kind of gamified world and where is it? Where, right. what, does it where, where does it all happen right now or yeah. will happen? Yeah, so, so, this, so in 2011, uh, one, of, uh, one of my favorite thinkers, business people, uh, investors, his name's Mark Andreessen, you know, it's at uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, he wrote this paper. It was an essay that he published. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was called Why Software is Eating the World, right? And, you know, that's that's almost a de full decade ago now. And um, as I was thinking the last couple of years, I'm actually writing right now an essay that's sort of like an update to that. Hmm. Um, nothing he said there is false, right? I mean, games are you know, software. These game engines are, are software. If you look at The Mandalorian, if you watch that, I mean, that whole movie was made using epic games their unreal engine you know so um, what I what I'm thinking about is you know that gaming is eating the world now gaming is eating culture um, and it doesn't mean video games 
it doesn't mean people staring at a screen playing a game. Um, as you said, there's gamification. And, and gamification is nothing more than taking, you know, game loops or, you know, certain kinds of layers of gaming, whether that's, you know, a location-based mechanic, whether that's rewards and achievements, whether that's, you know, some kind of an avatar function, and then applying them to kind of a non, again, another binary, but like a non-game space, like a loyalty program or, you know, uh, a membership program or, you know, uh, language learning, mm -hmm. these kinds of things. And so that's what gamification is. Um, but again, that rests on another binary that, I, that I'm challenging, which is that I don't think there's game and non-game anymore. I think everything is a game, literally. Like we're playing a game right now. You know, ga games, gaming doesn't mean it's not serious either. It just means it's more of a game theory definition. It just means like Adidas is a game. It's an open world. It's, a, it's an ecosystem. It's a platform, right? It's got all these different touch points and you're kind of the player moving around in that Adidas world. It's a brand, you know, and um, you could go to retail, you could go to the app, you could go to the website, you could go to an event and they're sort of moving you around, you know, in this world. Nike's the same. And so if you notice the trend here is like really every big company has kind of copied Apple's, you know, remember Walled Gardens were like, so out. It was the worst thing you could do. And now everybody's trying to build their own little ecosystem. And I just call that ecosystem a game. And there are all these little metaverses, right, that exist, these little game worlds. And so um, um, to get back on track then, it's I think that what has happened is COVID definitely accelerated a number. It, it accelerated the world by about five years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as if, you know, uh, people weren't playing a lot of video games and people weren't in Fortnite. You know, Fortnite's been around for a while. Roblox has been around since like 2005. You know, Minecraft has been around for a while. Um, Animal Crossing's, you know, been around for a minute as well. So it's, um, it, none of that's new. Um, but what happened was gaming has now become less about just playing the game and more of a social network. You know, it's sort of like what what all these social networks were for my generation and then kind of your generation as well. These were, that's where you hung out. That's where you contacted your friends. It's where you saw what people were doing, right? Um, and so that's what games have become. Yes, you go into Fortnite and play the game, but you also just hang there with your friends and you talk, you chat, and you spend money there. It's also the new mall, right? Mm. It's where It's where you learn skills. Uh, it's where you learn about how economies <laughs> work, right? So it's now also become entertainment spaces. You know, just uh, last week, Lil Nas X, you know, the American rapper did a concert. 35 million people showed up in Roblox to watch this concert. You know, that's a bit more than 20,000 at Staples Center. <laughs> um, and so you now have these, these metaverses, these virtual worlds that are social networks, they're malls, they're event spaces, they're places for commerce. For example, in Fortnite, um, there's a gaming collective uh, called 100 Thieves. They have a place in LA called the Cash App Compound. It's like their office. And they just recreated that in Fortnite. And you can like go in and you can actually like, you know, you'll be able to buy their merch, their real merch in the game. And so um, you're seeing a lot of the luxury brands get it. You know, we partnered with Gucci. You know, Louis Vuitton's designing stuff for League of Legends. Um, you've got uh, Chanel has done some really interesting things in the gaming space. So uh, Balenciaga just announced they're doing something. So Nike put stuff in Bitmoji. They put stuff in Fortnite. Adidas, I just got the new PS5, playing Miles Morales, Spider-Man. The new Adidas superstars, he's wearing them. <laughs> so it's like, that's just the new space. And and the, and the trick is that... Um, I, what I'm trying to do is how do you erupt the game off the screen, you know, and make it more of your, it's not your movement in this virtual world on the screen. It's also your movement, like in the world, because that's what you're doing, right? You're just, at least not, maybe not in a pandemic, but like normal times, you're moving, you're moving around in the world. And that's, it's very game-like. That's why certain games like Second Life that you referred to earlier are called Life Sims, you know, they're life simulations, the Sims. Yeah. 
The Sims, that's right. So um, the, 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 I think that the, these changes you mentioned uh, in a row are just the beginning, right? I mean, it's still like, if you talk about Adidas as a game, this is a kind of nearly, yeah, I would say theoretical approach to, 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 to build a roof over that idea of a corporate brand, as you also could call it, with different sections and ideas, that is a total different narrative to call it a game. Um, but, I mean, it, it, it fits totally into everything you said, but I don't think that a lot of people see it that way and kind of, you know, act as if they're in a game. It's still something to purchase, to buy, to be a member or not. Oh, no, maybe not. They have my data. No, sorry. And, and I think there is a lot to go to kind of overcome that, that idea that it's, that it's not a game and yeah. it's everywhere. And, and I think there is a big step to take, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think it is. I think it's, um, you know, my experience at Adidas was um, there's always this disconnect between theory and practice. So, you know, a lot of really smart people there, very par passionate people there um, that are trying to do really amazing things. And just given the complexity of such a big company, um, it's very hard to move at a fast pace. And the way things move today are so fast. And like I said, COVID just ex threw us in five years into the future suddenly. Um, and and what, do you, what do you do? There's no, sorry to keep bringing up the Lego movie, but it's like the beginning <laughs> of that movie, you know, Elliot has to read the instructions just to know how to breathe. It's like, how do you, what do you do? So I think people, let's, I'll distinguish between like first order and second order knowledge. I think people theoretically second order know these trends that I'm talking about, they, they can, you can sense it. You can see something weird's going on. And typically what happens is that people will say things like, oh, you, you have this new game where people are spending, you know, we have players that have spent like $15,000 in the game. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And it's like, well, it's happening. So it makes sense. What doesn't make sense is your mental model. You know, you, you don't get it. So we need to try to understand what's going on. And so you can start to see these things. So higher order, second order, you know it, you see it. But then there's that first order thing, which is like, okay, what do you do about it? How do I actually go about that? And so if you listen to bigger companies, they talk a lot about you know, the experience economy, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the experience economy is really all that different than what I'm saying, which is just you know, like it's experience marketing. You know, it's uh, it's it's the experience economy. It's viewing your retail store less as this place that you walk into and buy something, and more as a an experience. And an experience. Who designs better experiences than game designers? You know, so it's it's um, I think it's one of those things where I think people see it implicitly, but actually explicitly having a like a ma a map or a mental model to try to understand it or explain it and then have a space to make decisions. You know, that's what's crucial. It's kind of like you feel lost. It's like, man, this stuff's happening so fast. I don't get it. There, you know, ha what, like what's going on here? It's no different than back in the day, like hearing stories about you were like a big loser or like weird if you met your girlfriend or boyfriend online. Yeah, that's definitely you know? over. <laughs> now, now if you don't meet your girlfriend or boyfriend online, it, you're weird or a loser, you know? So it's like, it's, uh, it, those things just, they change and flip so quickly. And again, it's those binaries. And I think, again, game, non-game, there's no difference. And, you know, props to Adidas because, you know, one of their main brand things while I was there was game life world. They're a sportswear company. Um, also a big lifestyle category as well, but sports, those are games, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's maybe, and, sometimes and, it's that easy. <laughs> it's yeah, and, and economics, <laughs> economics, right? Economic theory is based on you know game theory. Um, so you know games are language is a game. You're you're playing a game. You're seeking certain outcomes, rules governing your behavior. Um, you know, I just think that uh, gaming, oh yeah, gaming is now eating the world. It's it's sort of this. The two big opportunity spaces are 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 games. And and this this idea of on life, these this convergence of of uh, of um, um, online and offline, and th yeah, the idea that you like escape it, 
that you're going to like, you know, go into the woods and live in a tree house or something um, for a bit to like get away from it all and unplug. That's that doesn't exist anymore. And the reason is because your identity is also the, the binary of like, again, my identity in real life and then like what I do online to escape. There is no escape because your identity is spread out. You might go in a tree house for a week, but, you know, you're still going to make a bank payment. There's a bank payment going to come out of your account. People will probably still like some of your, um, you know, some of your posts or whatever. You might get some messages on your phone, even if you didn't bring it, you know, like, you know, maybe you drove there. So if you're, you know, if you're driving in a car these days, a newer one, it's basically a computer on wheels. Yeah. So like there is no, there's no one escaping it. It's not a, it's not something you escape out of anymore. You're just, you are just in it. And that's the spatial internet idea. And you can, I think that's where the kind of pessimistic narrative ends, because it's not about escaping, yeah. it's about embracing and, and, and bringing it into the world for you as an individual. But uh, yeah. Ryan, it, it is like always. So when we talk, I have um, like 1,000 thoughts in my mind to, to add, but um, we want to skip this. Um, below 60 minutes so we come to an end and um, with that said I, I will try to do my third and last element with you um, which, which is called pick a hero and you mentioned a lot of your heroes during that conversation uh, a lot of really great minds and uh, I don't know um, who you would recommend or who you would want to see on this channel that I may be going to interview and you say hey that That might be somebody. Um, maybe you got one for me. Um, I think, um, uh, well, I'll go with two, actually. So there's a guy named John Egan who uh, is based in Paris. He runs a forecasting analysis uh, institute. Um, so he's not really a futurist. He's more about, you know, he and I click really well because it's about, again, these mental models, building, how do you build maps to explain what's happening so that you can make you know, informed, better decisions. Really, really smart guy. Um, very, very broad in his interests. And he has an incredible ability to kind of bring it all together into a story. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, he's based in Paris. It's called the L'Atelier. Um, I would recommend, uh, I would love to see what he has to say. He's doing some really incredible stuff on virtual economies um, and sort of the virtue, uh, the future of, you know, social mobility and kind of new jobs that will emerge in this kind of gamified virtual world future that we're talking about. Um, so that'd be the first guy. The second guy is actually a mentor of mine. Um, he's also a strategic advisor at Aglet. Um, his name's Jason Maiden. Um, also another incredibly smart guy. So he used to be, uh, he was the first um, um, African-American uh, design lead at Jordan brand. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, he was doing, um, leading the digital sports at, at Nike. He was actually the first person to put a sneaker into a video game. Uh, so well, when he was at Nike, they put Jordans into the NBA uh, 2K games. Um, oh, great. An just a really amazing, amazing person. He left Jordan, started his own kids sne streetwear sneaker company called Superheroic. Uh, he's now a VP at Logitech, leading their kind of influencer and in gaming uh, esports uh, uh, initiatives. Um, Lots to talk about with him. He's total kind of, you know, nerd geek, but like, you know, in the, in the coolest possible sense, um, you know, talking about culture, pop culture, you know, the future of design, technology trends, really, really fantastic guy and probably good to get some diverse, uh, you know, uh, points of view on the, on the uh, ECD. I, I would love to talk to them, but I'm also a bit afraid because this is really going deep, uh, but it's, it's so great. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, man. Appreciate um, it. I'm uh, yeah, hoping to see you again soon, either on screen or maybe off screen, or definitely see you on, on life. On life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the final word. And <laughs> uh, having that said, um, thanks for watching, everybody. I think we, we agree that was a really special and, and unique episode, um, like a look into the future, maybe, or uh, maybe the future has already begun, as we heard today. Um, Anyway, check out Aglet and the Aglet app on, on your mobile to see where maybe kind of gamification in commerce leads us in the future. And of course, to 
bring it back to our channel. Check out next week's edition here uh, on ECD Live because it's Matthias Meets time again. And uh, Trade Byte CEO Matthias Schulte uh, goes deep into the world of the retailer platform interaction with the former CDO of Sportcheck, Jan Kegelberg. And uh, I think it's a pretty good reason to dial in again at Wednesday at 11. And of course, like said every every once in a while and now again feel free to drop a comment uh, in the social media networks you use dropping uh, um, a feedback or uh, your opinion using hashtag easy live um, i'd love to have a chat with you and answer uh, your remarks that's it for today ECD Live Talk with me comes back on December 16th uh, with a little special. Um, check out our communication channels for more details. It will be very personal and very great, I promise. And so having that said, stay tuned, stay healthy and goodbye.